Do plants breathe? When we walk through a field or forest, we never hear them, but we know the plants are breathing. Plants are continuously taking up carbon dioxide and converting it into sugars and carbohydrates through the process of photosynthesis. This process is what creates the oxygen we breathe, and it can help remove some of the CO2 we are pumping into the atmosphere with the burning of fossil fuels. But photosynthesis requires more than just CO2. It also uses water. So as plants take up more CO2, how does this impact our water supplies? Marcy Litvak is looking into that very question. Um, my research program is focusing on the whole ecosystem exchange of carbon, water, energy, matter between the atmosphere and the plants and the soils. In general, the questions that I'm interested in are what happens when you have some sort of change in land cover and how does that alter the rate at which carbon, water, energy, etc. cycles through the ecosystem in the atmosphere. Water moves through plants from the soils to the atmosphere and you can measure that in several different ways. You can measure that at the leaf level by measuring the rate at which water is released from the leaves and you can measure that just knowing the leaf area and the rate at which water accumulates in a, an enclosed cuvette. Um, you can measure this at the landscape level as well by putting um, instruments up above the canopy and you can measure the total amount of water that's released from the land surface into the atmosphere which will be kind of an integrative measure of what all the plants are doing in terms of transpiration as well as evaporation of water from the soil surface. By recording and analyzing the movement of water and carbon dioxide, Marcy can focus on some questions that have been unanswered for years. Juniper trees are becoming more common, but are they really drinking up water supplies as some people like to claim? At the moment, we don't know if the woody vegetation that has become increasingly abundant in these historically open grasslands, and that's specifically mesquite and ash juniper, if they are using more water than the grasslands themselves. The only evidence that we have so far is anecdotal. And that uh, evidence is that a rancher cut down all the ash juniper on his property and then claimed that his springs were overflowing. But that's never been tested in a really formal way. We have these towers in four different stages of um, increasing woody presence on the landscape. So they go from a completely open pasture with no woody vegetation all the way to the worst case scenario of a closed canopy oak juniper woodland with two transition stages in between. And the basic idea is that we're able to measure in a very precise way how this change in woody vegetation has altered the amount of water vapor that's leaving the land surface and uh, being emitted into the atmosphere. And that will tell us something about um, the influence of woody vegetation on aquifer recharge. See, you see a, a funny shaped instrument that has arms like this, and that is measuring uh, basically updrafts and downdrafts. It uh, sends ultrasonic pulses from one transducer to another, and from that can get the speed of sound, and from that can get uh, wind direction, basically, and whether or not the, the, it's sensing an updraft or a downdraft. The other instrument that's kind of um, in between the instrument with the arms is called an infrared gas analyzer, and that is measuring um, carbon dioxide concentration and water vapor concentration. How does Marcy measure the movement of invisible gases like carbon dioxide and water vapor? Both temperature and the amount of sunlight have a big influence on the total amount of carbon that is taken up and the total amount of water vapor that is released. And it takes some very specialized instruments to measure these changes. In periods where the updrafts contain much more water vapor than the downdrafts, those end up um, being periods where there's a high amount of water that's leaving the landscape being transferred into the atmosphere. At night, when there's not a whole lot of water being released from uh, plants or from the soils, that flux ends up being zero. So we see during specific times of the year when plants are most active, and that is typically when there's the most rainfall, 
in the hill country, so that's in the spring and in the fall. During those periods, we see the highest amount of flux of water vapor from the surface, where a lot of the precipitation that's coming in appears to be recycled through these plants into the atmosphere. So just what happens when woody species like mesquite or juniper move into areas that were historically open grasslands? Just how is Marcy trying to answer these questions? One way to look at it is in terms of are these woody species using more water and therefore reducing the amount of recharge that's getting into the aquifer. But another way to look at it has to do with the amount of carbon that might be sequestered in these ecosystems if woody species come in and replace the grasses. And that has to do with just thinking about the total amount of carbon that's contained in the biomass of a tree versus a grass. And when you swap one for one, you're getting a lot more carbon that's being uh, taken up by the ecosystem itself, which is really important from the atmospheric perspective because you reduce the amount of carbon dioxide that's, that remains in the atmosphere. So the amount of uh, carbon dioxide that's released into the atmosphere each year through humans, basically through burning fossil fuels or through cement production, releases about seven gigatons of carbon on an annual basis into the atmosphere. Marcy has also worked extensively in Canada's boreal forest. The trees in the boreal forest are much bigger than the trees in Texas. But how do these landscapes differ in the amount of carbon they absorb? They're both very important players in the global carbon cycle. The boreal forests are really important in terms of the amount of carbon they store. So per square meter, they store more carbon than almost any other biome on the face of the earth. So they're, they're important from that standpoint. Texas savannas and savannas in general store less carbon per square area but they occupy such a large amount of the Earth's surface that they still play a large role in the global carbon cycle because of the amount of land area that they occupy. It really becomes kind of a balance of one environmental problem <laughs> versus another at that point because you can increase the amount of carbon in these ecosystems, but you might be using more water and therefore reducing the amount of groundwater recharge, and the balance between those two is not known. This is one of the questions that we're really addressing right now. We just don't know in which direction this will go at the moment. 